to let us come to the ten minute rule bill. Mark Palsy. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I beg to move that leave be given to bring in a bill to require a person riding a bicycle on the public highway to wear a safety helmet and for connected purposes. Mr Speaker, back in November 2015, my then 15-year-old constituent, Oliver Dibsdale, was cycling along Hillmorton High Street in Rugby when his foot slipped off the pedal and he fell. He hit his head on the kerb and was left with a serious brain injury. He spent four weeks in critical care and a further 15 weeks at Birmingham Children's Hospital and then at the Central England Rehabilitation Unit in Leamington Spa. Mr Speaker, Oliver had hoped to be in the public gallery here today, but because of the severity of his disability, he would have needed two support staff to accompany him from rugby, and he would have had to meet the significant cost of their travel expenses. Oliver was told by his doctor, Dr Badwan, that had he been wearing a helmet, he may still have sustained an injury, but that it would have been far less severe. When I met Oliver, he told me that he usually wore a helmet when cycling, and he bitterly regrets his decision uh, on that particular occasion to ride without a helmet. He has spoken to me in a very moving way about the impact that uh, his, his injuries had on his family, the guilt that he feels for the amount of time they have had to spend caring for him, and he very much wants to help other families avoid this fate, and this bill will achieve this aim. Now, mandatory wearing of cycle helmets has been considered here in Parliament. My honourable friend, the member for Wellingborough, introduced the Bicycles Children's Safety Helmets Bill as long ago as 2007, and a broader debate took place on the topic of cycling safety in Westminster Hall on the 21st of November 2012, when nine members took part. And at a personal level, on a recent family holiday, uh, we rented bikes when the person serving us offered me a helmet, which I initially declined. He then looked me in the eye and asked me, just how many brains have you got, sir? Uh, I took the hint and I took the helmet. But there's not always someone on hand to offer such advice uh, and ensure that a helmet is worn. And anybody who has children will know, children don't always take that advice. Oliver makes the point that it will be far easier for parents to insist that their children wear a helmet if it becomes a legal requirement. When Oliver first contacted me nearly two years ago, he asked whether the government would consider making cycle helmets a legal requirement. He explained to me about his own circumstances and that he, six years after his accident, he remains in a wheelchair and he is likely to do so for the rest of his life. He's lost the use of his left arm and he's lost, missed out on so much that his peers have experiences, experienced. And he finds it extremely frustrating whenever he sees cyclists on the road without helmets, because from his personal experience, he knows all too well the risk that they are taking. After my meeting with Oliver, I wrote on his behalf to the Department of Transport, and I received an explanation of the work that's been undertaken as part of the cycling and walking investment strategy that occurred in 2017, and a subsequent consultation in 2018. The focus of this work has been quite rightly to increase levels of cycling and walking and to make the UK's roads safer for vulnerable users, including cyclists. And following this work, the Department's clear advice to all cyclists, as set out in Rule 59 of the Highway Code, is that cyclists should wear helmets but the Government doesn't intend to legislate. I shared the Government's response with Oliver, and Oliver continues to contest uh, this response, and it makes a very compelling case uh, in his own experience for helmets to become mandatory. So to take his case further, 
I arranged for Oliver to meet my honourable friend, the member for Copeland and the then Minister for Transport. Oliver was really pleased to have the opportunity to make his case here in Westminster to the Minister and I thank my honourable friend for accommodating us. We had an excellent discussion, but to Oliver's disappointment, the government's position remains unchanged and that the wearing of helmets should be a matter of choice and not compulsory. Oliver continues to disagree and he draws attention to a number of counts. He points out the fact that it's illegal to drive a car without a seatbelt and it's compulsory to wear a helmet on a motorcycle. And to this, those who oppose mandatory wearing of cycle helmets respond that unlike travelling by car and motorbike, there is a health benefit for, from using a bicycle and that there should not be any discouragement at all uh, to people from cycling and that further that some people might be put off cycling thereby reducing the wider health and environmental benefits. I'm afraid to this Oliver replies that if people do want to exercise there are many ways of exercising that, pre that prevent, present less risk and he points out that people can walk, can run, can take up a sport or go to the gym. A further line uh, of argument cited by opponents to mandatory wearing is that legislation would be difficult to enforce and while it would certainly create an additional burden on the police it doesn't strike me as being particularly difficult to enforce in comparison with other offences. It's easy to spot a cyclist without a helmet than it would be to spot a driver using a mobile telephone. It's easier to spot a cyclist without a helmet than to spot a car passenger without a seatbelt. And nobody here suggests that wearing seatbelts should be a matter of individual choice on the basis of difficulties in enforcing the current legislation. Now, in support of mandatory wear of helmets, the 2016 review and analysis of previous research undertaken by Oliver and Crichton drew on data from 64,000 injured cyclists. They found very large protective effects from helmets, estimating 85 and 88 per cent reductions in head and brain injury, respectively, for helmeted cyclists relative to unhelmeted. The House of Commons Library notes that pedal cyclists are 23 times more likely to experience fatality or a casualty than a motorist. So, Mr Speaker, if mandatory safety measures are acceptable for car drivers, they should surely be acceptable for cyclists. Now, we know that cyclists are the most vulnerable road users, and given all of the data about how much safer cyclists are when they wear a helmet, given the very strong arguments that Oliver makes, and all of these arguments coming from a person who acknowledges that his life has been transformed by the simple, simple failure to put on his helmet on that fateful day in 2015, this bill to mandate the wearing of helmets by cyclists is intended to ensure that far fewer cyclists have to suffer the experience that Oliver went through and has to live with every day of his life, and I commend it to the House. The, the Honourable Member have leave to bring in the bill. The question is that the Honourable Member have leave to bring in the bill. As many of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Who will prepare to bring in the bill? Mr Speaker, Judith Cummins, Dan Carden, Mr Peter Bone, <coughs> Dr Luke Evans and myself. Mark Palsy.
Road Safety Cycle Helmets Bill. Second reading what day? Friday, 24th of November. Friday, the 24th of November. Right. We now come to the first of